while that's occurring, just going to ask for identification of any media on the line. Hearing none. Oh. Welcome, Donna and David. We're just doing identification of media. So if you could just uh, identify yourself. Uh, again, Donna, David, if you could just do the identification of media. Oh, hi, Donna from the Two Row Times. And I do see David is still connecting, so we'll acknowledge that David Moses is also on the line as media. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome the community to the General Council meeting of February 28th, uh, 2023. Uh, note that start time of 6.07. Um, having um, done the first two agenda items, we're looking to adopt the agenda. So can I get a mover seconder? Moved by Audrey. Second by Sherry Lynn. Is there any additional items uh, or discussion on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll go to the vote. All in favor? Is there any opposed? Hearing and seeing none, motion has passed. This brings us to the first delegation, um, First Nations Drinking Water, and uh, understand we have some guests coming in, Laura Edwards and Robert James. Welcome, Laura, welcome, Robert. Uh, we've just adopted the agenda and um, we're ready to turn it over to you for the update on the First Nations Drinking Water Settlement. So Laura, it's over to you. I'm here just as a backstop if any additional questions come up. Okay. Well, the big update on the settlement, of course, is that they've extended the claims period by a whole year. So individuals now have until March 7th, 2024 to submit an application for compensation. Um, so this gives your members an opportunity um, to file an application for compensation, whereas before we were on that really tight timeline of about two or three weeks. So you have more time to get those materials together uh, to submit. Yes, Nathan? Yeah, I'm wondering, Laura, if you could take a minute or two and just uh, give a quick synopsis of what the settlement is, uh, just for the benefit of the community members. We are live to the community right now. So if you could just take a minute just to kind of uh, set the context. Oh, great. Thank you for that. Yeah, so the Drinking Water Clash Action Settlement um, addresses Canada's failure to provide clean and safe drinking water on reserves from the period of November uh, 20th, 1995 to June 20th, 2021. And it was about Canada's um, failure and its duty uh, to provide clean drinking water. Um, and there were, oh, sorry. I think that's about it. <laughs> but I think to add to it, what's happened since then is that the action was started as a class action. So it was brought by one nation, potentially on behalf of a wide range of nations. And then subsequently, there was a settlement agreement uh, that was led by the government of Canada and a couple of the nations uh, that were in charge of the class action. And now we're at the point where each nation in Canada uh, has to determine if they want to be part of the class action. And then... The, there is a process for determining if they're eligible to be in the class action. And with the essential idea being that if you're in the class action, you get whatever the class action promises. Um, and if you're not in the class action, then there's more limited rights, but you can still pursue another lawsuit. That's perfect. In terms of the context setting, Audrey, I do see your hand, okay. um, but we are um, just doing the context so community knows what That's we're what talking about in terms of that. Um, anything else, uh, um, Robert or Laura, in terms of the context setting? Um, I know, Laura, before I cut you off, you were just going into a bit of the update of the current. 
Uh, yeah, I, I covered most of the current update. The real big change here is that uh, potential class members have a whole additional year to apply for compensation, whereas before the cutoff was March 7th of this year. Okay, so I'm going to go start going to the questions. I first have Audrey and then Sherry Lynn. Audrey, you have the floor. Thank you. My question is, what are the significant of the dates? The significance of the dates, um, well, previously, individuals who could be part of the class action only had until March 7th to apply for compensation under class actions. So once the date was up, individuals who might have been eligible no longer would have been able to apply for compensation. Uh, and as well, the March 7th deadline was also the deadline for eligible um, First Nations on the list of impacted First Nations to accept the settlement agreement. About the 1995. Oh, okay. So the dates of the November um, 20th, 1995 to June 21st, uh, or sorry, June 20th, 2021 is the claim is the class period. So people who are part of the class or First Nations who might be part of the class uh, had to have a drinking water advisory that lasted longer for one year um, on and be living on that reserve uh, during that time period. And that is what the class action settlement is, is settles the claims for. But so part of the reason for the, the, those particular dates is because those represent what's called the limitation period. So you, normally claims can only go back so far. And so essentially that is from the date that the claim was the, uh, decided to a certain number of years back. And essentially the number of years back reflects the view that, um, that, that they wouldn't be able to claim damages for further back than that. Okay, my question is that says you have to have a boiled water. So people have wells that are contaminated and they have to buy water, have water delivered, are they included as well? They may be included if they can demonstrate that they had a drinking water advisory uh, on that well for longer than a year, whether that was a boil water advisory or a do not consume advisory uh, or other similar advisory. Um, and it had to be issued by some sort of governing body, whether it was the First Nation Health Authority or um, the province or the federal government like Health Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you, Audrey. And thanks, Laura and Robert. I'm going to go to Sherry Lynn. Um, just a couple. Uh, the first one is everybody in the household can apply. Is that correct? If they resided uh, on reserve for a period of one year during that affected period, then the person can apply. Okay. And my second one is I see Rod Whitlow on the, on the line, even for the water advisories. Is there any dates that um, you can give, Rod, for the community? Uh, yeah, sorry, if, if it's okay, Councillor Nathan, I'll just add a few few points here. Yeah, so myself and uh, Sarah Curley uh, Smith and and a few other folks, we have looked at all of the documentation um, in the archives and in the, in the records, um, and we've even pulled out some archived um, media out, um, articles from the newspaper, local newspapers. So we have determined um, as far back as the year 2000, um, the then Chief uh, Dave General, um, did mentioned he did mention the boil water advisory for the community and he had indicated that it had been actually in place um, I think he said um, for many years I think it even goes back so it actually predates the the claim start period of 1995 so that's at a general level what what we kind of been re how we've been responding to community inquiries um, that um, the boil water advisory at a, at a high level generic level um, for the whole community has existed for the entire claim period with with a notation that each in it is the on the on the each individual household to determine um, if they've had additional documentation or different advisories issued by 
um, Health Canada or Indigenous Service Canada, whether it was the late Paul Strohak or Peter Hill, to say, do not drink the water. So there's different, um, in, in, the, in the settlement agreement, there's actually different um, uh, degrees of compensation, whether it was a boil water advisory or a drinking water advisory, or even do not use. So I'll just, I'll leave it there. I know there's probably a lot more questions. <laughs> Sorry. That's good, thank you. Thanks for that, Sherry, Lynn, and Rod. And, and I think because of the technicalities, I think it's gonna be important for us to do a um, Q&A um for your information on this particular just on on you know the boy the technicalities of boil water advisories do not use uh and we got the expertise within us um so i have a list i have uh, michelle greg and then hazel so michelle you have the floor okay so laura robert we are not on that list but we've asked to be added to that list and so individuals who've applied does that impact their application Yes, so until Six Nations is included on the list of impacted First Nation, technically Six Nations and any individuals cannot be a part of the class. So it's not until that application is accepted that individuals of Six Nations um, can join the class. So you are able to put an application in and provide evidence to the administrator that you should be included, but they have the um, the application right now, and and they will determine whether or not um, Six Nations will be part of that. Okay, so I'm assuming you put in our application, and what is the turnaround for that? When will we know? So the application was a band council acceptance resolution and uh, affidavit filed by the chief stating that um, the um, reserve was affected by these drinking water advisories during the relevant period and that you should be included on the list of impacted First Nations. And that was put in, I believe, uh, right at the middle of January, if I recall correctly. Um, but I don't know what the turnaround time is. I haven't heard um, how long it takes the claims administrator to process the, those applications. I'm almost wondering, could we send a note in and, and get some uh, clarity around that particular um, time period? That's what the community wants to know, right? Like we need to be added, I, I would think. Or do we go ahead with our own, yeah. our own suit? So just identify that as kind of a next step to um, get some clarity around that date uh, and, and feed that back in uh, to community. Um, so uh, I'm wondering, actually, Greg, I'm just gonna jump to Tammy. Uh, Tammy, do you have some uh, additional information on that particular question? So with regards to Laura's right, it did, I, I was the one who actually submitted it to with Laura's help, of course, and when council passed the bank council resolution acceptance resolution. So all of that, along with the affidavit, was sent by email to the administrator. They didn't respond for a couple of weeks, but we did actually get confirmation that they received it. And since then, I've been sending emails at least, if not every week, every couple of weeks saying like, what's the status? And they keep saying, yes, we're reviewing the material, we'll be in touch soon. So before the end of the day today, I actually sent an email asking like, administrator, can you give us an, an update on what the status of Six Nations being added to the list of affected communities? So I would expect probably tomorrow we'll hear another response, hopefully. Hopefully in the affirmative, but at, or some type of decision that way we can make a decision or council can have the information to make a decision on next steps. Appreciate that. Uh, so we're on it. Okay, so I'm going to move us to uh, Greg and then Hazel. Greg, you have the floor. Uh, yeah. So um, just overall, just for my understanding, is that um, for the community's best interest is to be on the list. Is the way I under, understand it. If we're if we don't get on the list, we still do apply, with uh, the chance that we may not be accepted. Is that correct? So right now, uh, yes, there is an application in by the band to be put on the list of impacted First Nations, and until 
um, the band is added to that list, no one is eligible for compensation, whether it's the band or individuals. But in the meantime, individuals can still submit an application to try and get compensation and to provide documentation to show that Six Nations should be on the list um, and that they are entitled to that compensation. It's just extra work for the individuals to have to go through that part of the process rather than waiting for the claims administrator to give a response um, either way. Uh, just to follow up, Nathan. Um, yeah. So uh, would proof be, uh, say, a letter stating what uh, was already stated by uh, Chief Dave General that we did have a water advisory? Uh, would that be enough to, uh, if we did not get on the list, would that be enough proof to go so that they could uh, win that part of the settlement? Is that is that correct? Right, so if um, the claims administrator initially decides not to add Six Nations onto that list of impacted First Nations, there is a, I believe, 60-day period of time where you can submit more documents to show that you should be on that list. And certainly that letter would help, but the most helpful things are any sort of drinking water advisory, whether that is um, a letter from Health Canada advising individuals not to consume, and many of those over a few years, or uh, the Six Nations Health Authority or the Public Health Authority um, for Ontario, um, giving out those uh, advisories and having more than one so you can show that they've lasted for more than one year. But, but Greg, to answer your question a little bit, another aspect of your question, is if the nation doesn't get approved, it's pretty unlikely that they'll approve individuals based on sort of similar evidence. Like really the whole advantage of the nation applying is that if the nation's in, then the members are in and the members don't have to go through the process of individually trying to convince the administrator. Uh, but if, if for some reason uh, the, the, the nation can't get across the line, then it's going to be pretty hard for individuals to do it because really the kind of thing they're looking for are those documents that Laurie described, those more official documents they can point to saying, you know, here's a public authority who did tests and ordered uh, a boil water advisory or something like that. Yeah, well, that was uh, my point is that uh, that proof would be very difficult for our individual members to get. So, yes, the other the final question I had is if um, they go ahead and they uh, apply and they basically get on the list, they don't have to apply again, right? Right, if if the claim is, or if an individual's application is accepted and they get compensation, they would not have to apply again. I think it would probably be unlikely for that to happen given that the administrator does have an application from the band as a whole to be added to that list of impacted First Nations. But yeah, if, if the administrator reviews an individual's application, decides there's enough evidence here to show that they're entitled compensation and they should be a class member, they wouldn't have to reapply. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that, Greg and Laura. I'm going to move to Hazel and then we have a few questions coming in from Facebook Live. So Hazel, you have the floor. Okay. Um, <clears throat> first of all, why was Six Nations not put on that list? As as one of the first nations who who were affected by drinking uh, the ban on drinking water, why were they not included in the list? I'm also just going to jump in here, Hazel, because that's the exact same question that's coming from Facebook. Is so I want to address the Facebook question while your question is being asked as well. Um, so Jr. Fitz is asking why is Six Nations or Six Nations Forty? not listed as a, uh, a a community with the water claim? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it would appear that maybe on Canada sides, they didn't keep enough records to show that there was drinking water advisory lasting longer than one year. But this is why we have to go through the exercise to provide those records. From our perspective, we're saying, hey, here's the proof that Six Nations should be, but I, I don't know why you were left off okay. the list initially. Further to that, I want to say that that indicates to me that there's ignorance on the side of the government because they don't know the true factors of 
the water situation on all First Nations because everybody had their water uh, through a well. Mm -hmm. Nobody had running water for quite a while. And if they're comparing to um, residential areas off reserve, yeah, they all had running water, but we didn't. Yeah. In our my own personal situation, we've had two wells, one dug and one drilled, and a cistern. And every one of those were uh, condemned because they were not, it was not good water. Mm -hmm. So for so long, we've had to buy water. And not only that, if you ask a number of First Nations people on this reserve, who all has those, um, buys that water, like the water for the coolers, uh, like the drinking water, simply because you you had to become accustomed to not drinking that water. So now it's just an automatic thing. Everybody goes and buys that water, puts it on a cooler, and that's their drinking water for the household. Thank you. Thanks, Hazel. Thank Great context. Okay, I saw um, Rod uh, flash his hand up, and I believe he's going to provide some further context, please. So I'll turn it over to Rod and then Audrey. Yeah, uh, just a, a few more points. Uh, um, so the whole notion of the of the boil water advisory. So you recall that the prime minister made a, a promise to end the boil water advisories in all of First Nations across Canada by such a date. That didn't happen. <clears throat> so if you if you look at in other jurisdictions around Six Nations, and so there might be Brant County or Norfolk County, they might issue a boil water advisory, a temporary one that lasts a few weeks. And then there's a criteria. The criteria that they use is you have to have um, two to three consecutive tests to, to indicate that there's no more bacteriological contamination of that well. So in the Six Nations context, we just don't have that degree of rigor. We don't have that degree of programming. We, we don't have the resources to test every single well uh, more than one or once or twice a year. So we're at a disadvantage in that regard because um, and the very nature of the boil water advisory is it will remove bacteriological contamination. It will not, no amount of boiling will remove other contaminants, whether it's heavy metals or hydrocarbons. So um, in, that, that, in that case it would be a, a do not drink. But the question um, um, from Councillor Hazel about why were we never on there? That was a question that consistently came up. Every Friday, um, I think it was Health Canada at the time, they had a thing that would, they would release a thing called water tracks. And so it would come out and they would say, such and such a community is on a boil water advisory. And for this reason, the top two reasons why they were on that boil water advisory is because there was something in the water treatment plant itself or the, the, tr the water treatment plant operator did not meet the the, the required um, training to, to run that plant properly. So if you think about it, so if that's the government's um, end goal is to get all the Northern remote First Nations off of boil water advisory, they intend to do that by giving them enough resources so that their water treatment plant is operating to um, provincial standards and that their water treatment plant operators are fully qualified. We will, we're, we're never gonna be in that situation here at Six Nations until every single well is abandoned and we're all connected to the drinking water distribution system community wide, or in the interim, if that's not going to happen, then we're, we're each gonna have to have a cistern because the, all, all of these engineering reports that have come out over the years about the, the quality of the ground um, groundwater here at Six Nations, it's just not, it, it cannot be used without proper treatment. Um, so that we're, at, we're always gonna be at a, a disadvantage. So people say, well, um, the boil water advisory is actually still in effect. Yes, indeed, since June 20th, 2021, the end of the claim period to the present day, you should not be drinking any water from any well, whether it's drilled or dug without proper mm -hmm. treatment. So I, I know there's a lot more to unpack there, so I'll, I'll just leave it there. Thanks for that, Rod. And, and that just stresses the importance of us getting out an FAQ, frequently asked questions to the community on this particular issue. So uh, just got to underscore that. Uh, Audrey. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to know if anyone um, asked Peter Hill for any kind of records that they had and the former uh, Paul Strohack, because uh, they tested most of the wells on the reserve here that were contaminated. And also, um, if people were looking at getting um, treatment for their water, the company that they went to, like, um, what's it called? Callaghan? Callaghan. 
Okay, those water type places would have tested the water as well. Our, our well had lead in it. And um, it was tested several times and it never got any better. So we had to go to a cistern and buy water for decades now. Also the gypsum mine near the number six highway, all the people who live in, in that area were all affected by that. You know, um, the poor quality water. So has that been looked into as well? You know. Yes, Audrey, and all yes to all of your questions. The Environment Task Force did uh, their extreme due diligence on this particular issue, and hats off to Rod who led that uh, investigation. As I, I continue to say, Rod's uh, one of the best stewards of uh, our documents going forward. So uh, an extensive search was done uh, in terms of finding every document possible going forward. Yeah, well, thanks, Rod. I hear an echo. Um, so I see no further questions, uh, and in terms of next steps, uh, I underscored twice the importance of getting an FAQ out to the community, so uh, something will definitely action out um, going forward, and as Tammy indicated, uh, she is um, doing her due diligence and uh, requesting an update on a, on a weekly or daily basis uh, to get the information on whether or not we are accepted in the class action. So we'll follow up with the community as we get information. Um, Melba, I see you have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Should we be cautious in applying early? The reason why I'm asking that is once acceptance, Six Nations is accepted as part of the class action, will, will early appliers be included in that class action of Six Nations? Will they all be included? We're actually a late applier. We're not an early applier. We're, we're a late applier. Well, they're saying March. People are coming into this office getting help filling out that before March 7th. So that's what I'm calling early appliers. <laughs> yeah. It's so been extended though. I know it has, but what I'm saying, will the ones that are applying now be by the 7th of 23 be included yes, they will. when and if we are accepted? Yes, they will be. Okay, I just wanted to uh, the community to know because as you know, there was, there was, uh, with our day schools, we, we had very anxious people. And uh, many, many people are very, uh, I guess, cautious now because they would have done things differently at that time if they knew more information. Thanks. Can I just say something that is that Melba, you ultimately are pointing out something that's very practical more than anything else, which is um, like it won't make any difference to the individual if they are, you know, 100 days early or two days early, but it'll make a huge difference if they're two days late. And there's nothing like getting yourself into line before the deadline, um, you know, so that you don't end up on the last day trying to find a piece of paper or fill out a form. You don't get caught in a snowstorm on the way to the mailbox, whatever it is. Um, it's it's better, um, as I think we all have been told by our parents at one time or another. It's better not to be last minute about things. So, because um, uh, because after this, I don't think there'll be any more extensions of the deadline. Thanks for that, Robert and Melba, Tammy. I just wanted to add that those those are some of the questions that when we, we make a call to the administrator that we want to seek clarification on because right now we want to we want to be able to answer that question that anybody who's applied it are is are those applications from Six Nations just being put in a pile or are they going to be receiving a letter that say Six Nations is not on a list denied. Because from what I understand, you can only apply at one time. And we're not clear on how the administrator is going to be handling it. So that's a question that we'd like to, to ask the administrator when we're able to, to have that conversation with them. Great clarification. 
And just in terms of the question from Facebook is, do we have an individual um, on staff that uh, can field the calls currently? Um, there is a question from Facebook of who to talk to and who to contact uh, within the administration. So currently we, we've been having Lori Martin do assistance to people who want assistance with their with their claims. Um, any questions that she's not been able to answer, then what she does is she writes them down. And there's a list of questions that we're going to be making uh, a call to the administrator for to, to get clarification. But really, um, I think one of the things we've been trying to do is use those numbers as much as we can to seek those answers for community. But, you know, I know community doesn't trust people at the other end of a 1-800 number. So if there's any questions that they want us to ask for them, we will do that. But the other thing is on the Drinking Water website, there is quite a few FAQs already listed there, but it does take some time to go through and read them. So uh, we may pull some of the end, or if we're able to pull some of the FAQs from that website and share that out with community, or we may look to having a more condensed version available to community. Thanks for that, Tammy. And Hazel. I'm just wondering if it's possible to have a similar uh, call in to the radio station as we did during the pandemic when the, the doctor came on and the community were able to ask all the questions, whoever is in charge of this class action and who knows all the details, could we invite them to a Zoom call in? And like, we could all ask questions because us as counselors, we only know so much about this and it seemed like there's more information that uh, they must have that we don't have. and. Like, we want to be sure about this. I guess the main thing is, like, the exclusion of Six Nations. Like I said a few minutes ago, all of the people had wells, either dug or drilled. And um, every one of those would be um, contaminated wells. So we've lived with that for years even outside of these time frames that they've got classified, they should have just picked a date and went back to however many years ago it would have all come out the same in the end. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just gonna note that we're all requesting the same thing in terms of getting information and accurate information out to the community. And and I am hearing from Tammy that they are collecting and, and working on getting as much of that information collected so we can get an FAQ uh, out to the community. And even to your point, Hazel, uh, invite the, um, I guess it would be the administrator down. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's uh, something that we are actioning going forward. So I do see some additional hands are going to go to Robert and then Tammy. We can't hear you, Robert. You're on mute. Robert, you're on mute. Uh, I think we should not be optimistic that the administrator or the federal government or the lawyers for the plaintiffs will make themselves available to answer Q and A's. And 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 you know, let me let me just cast a little bit of light on what's going on here so that um, people appreciate what's happening, what the role of these different people are. Um, so it, it's not so much that Six Nations was excluded because there are a lot of nations, most nations were not specifically listed. It, instead, the whole process was set up to give nations a process for getting in or for staying out if they wanted to stay out. So the idea was that, that basically the whole process except for a certain number of nations who were involved at the very beginning, um, would only would have the choice about whether or not to come in. The way the settlement is written, 
still has a lot of questions in it. Like, like you know, we've been talking about wells and such like that. Amongst the lawyers who are dealing with these things, I don't just mean at our firm, I mean in all the firms, there are real questions about how it applies to well water systems. Um, and, you know, some lawyers say one thing, some lawyers say the other thing. And the administrator is kind of acting like a judge who's going to, he's going to look or she, they're going to look at the agreement, they're going to interpret the agreement, and they're going to start saying, you're in, you're out, and we're going to hear. And so in many ways, that administrator is meant to be a bit independent. Um, and in some ways also, um, you know, there's, there's probably going to be some fights afterwards about who's in and who's out. So I, my suspicion is that, you know, we can always ask, but you're going to be pretty unlikely to get um, the administrator to come down to answer questions. Um, the administrator is basically going to say, my answer is going to be my decision, and you'll see my decision when it comes up. And, and to give you a sense of what it's like, and I mean, I don't mean to uh, cause alarm, but I just want you to be open-eyed about what's going on, is for some of our other clients, like we've asked the, the, the federal lawyers, what does this mean? And we've asked the provincial lawyer, uh, the, 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 the lawyers who acted for the plaintiffs, what does this mean? And they've said different things. Um, and so uh, I, I think there's, you know, like, like the settlement agreement is, I don't know, Laura, I, I've forgotten, is it like 50 pages long, 60 pages? It's, it's not a little, it's not a short agreement. It's a very complex agreement. And, um, and, and so, you know, I think we are going to find out. Now, I, um, I'm optimistic that you'll get in, and if you get in, it will be a good thing because all of these drinking water suits are very complicated. And, and let me just give you an example of what you just said. You know, like the drinking water suit actually isn't meant to cover, for example, contamination from runoff from a mining facility. Like the federal government would probably take the view that that's a nuisance case that you should be bringing against whatever the mining operation is. And of course, we get into a fight with them about they issued the permit and all this sort of stuff. So, you know, like, like, but like if you, once we hear from the administrator, it may be that this will be easy and then members can apply and there'll be compensation and, you know, costs will be kept in control. But if you don't hear from the minister, if you hear an adverse result with the minister, either you can start your own lawsuit or you could potentially challenge the decision of the administrator. There are ways to do that. So I would, I would hang tight. I mean, we can help prepare an FAQ, um, you know, that you can give out to the community, but I think it's going to be very um, um, hopeful to get anybody to come down to interpret the agreement. I think it, the administrator and the lawyers for the government and for the plaintiff, they're just going to point at the agreement and says, you can read it for yourself, um, which is, like I said, I've got to say uh, a lot of, a lot of problems uh, come out of reading that agreement and, and we're going to find out what it means. So you're you basically you're going to hear a certain amount of the lawyer saying it probably means this, it likely means this, but there'll be some wiggle room in there because we're still waiting to hear from the administrator. Thanks for that, Robert. So I'm going to start winding this conversation down. We are starting to um, get some repetitive uh, themes here in terms of getting information out to the community. Um, and thanks for the assistance. We'll probably take that up, Robert, on, on assistance for that uh, FAQ. Uh, but I do have one final question coming in from the community on Facebook Live. Um, is there any truth to what I am hearing that if you get your application in before the original deadline of March 7th, 2023, you would get money later this year. But if you wait and apply after March 7th, 2023, you would have to wait for the money until after 2024. No, the claims administrator is supposed to process individual applications within a certain time frame, it slips my mind right now exactly how long that is, but I, 
only a few weeks um, in total, but no, you shouldn't have to wait <laughs> until past the new deadline. Okay, appreciate that. Thanks for that clarification. And, and just an underscore note to add that to our frequently asked questions going out to the community. Okay, with that, I see no additional um, questions. So I'm going to ask that uh, we accept this I presentation. I think Audrey has her as... hand up, I hate to say. Oh, final question. You're on mute. Just on mute, and I unmuted myself. Anyway, does that mean that the last question, that if six stations gets in, they may get paid earlier? Because they're not going to pay somebody if the Six Nations Reserve isn't in, correct? Yeah, that's correct. That's what I thought. And the other one is, what's the um, possibility of us doing our own lawsuit and how expensive would it be? Or is it better to go with the, um, get in the class action? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I... <laughs> I'm not sure how expensive it would be to do your own lawsuit. I just know it would be quite pricey. Uh, you could bring your own lawsuit if you choose to um, withdraw your application from being put on the list of impacted First Nations or if the administrator denies you. Uh, I just don't know if that will be successful or not. There's a certain amount of risk there involved and you can still bring a lawsuit for any um, damages or any claim you might have arising after June 21st, 2021. So you can bring a lawsuit now for that period, or you can bring a lawsuit going back until your first, uh, until Canada first failed to provide you with clean drinking water. But in terms of the expense uh, and how long that would take in complexity, I don't have enough information to tell you what that would look like. Maybe Ro Robert would probably have a bit better idea, but you know, it would be pricey. I think at this point, we don't want to confuse the situation as much as it already is. Uh, so <laughs> well, let's go step by step in terms of determining whether or not we're going to be included in this uh, particular settlement. Uh, always uh, knowing, Audrey, that uh, we do have that in our back pocket to uh, to do and start our own. Okay, with that, I see no more further questions. Just checking Facebook Live. I see no more further questions on Facebook Live. So I will ask if I can get a motion to accept uh, this presentation from Laura Edwards and Robert James from JFK Law as information. Moved by Audrey. Seconded by Greg. Uh, any further questions, comments? Seeing none, moving to the vote. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, motions carried. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Robert, for uh, for your time today. And I do note, um, maybe for the first time in history, we are exactly right on time. Nice to see you all. Great. Nice to have see a, you. Thank have you. Have a great day, guys. Bye. So I'm going to ask that uh, we move into our next delegation. Um, we have Bell Canada and uh, Melanie Pion with us, uh, Senior Manager for Indigenous Relations. Can I ask that she be put in the room if she hasn't already? Is she in the waiting room? Yes, she's just joining. Perfect. Tammy, go ahead. Council, you remember a few weeks back, there was other, uh, some other individuals from Bell Canada who had actually been before council on the on the Zoom asking for permission to solicit. And there was some follow-up work that you had asked to be done. So in the interim, we had been contacted by uh, Melanie letting, letting us know that there is an Indigenous Relations Division within Bell Canada and that she had wanted to reach out to those individuals that had come straight to council. And so this is the result of that little bit of work that was done. So now Melanie's here to, I guess, move the issue of, or move the, the request along. Perfect, thanks for that context, Tammy.
Hi, Nathan. Sorry, Melanie's just having some technical difficulties. She'll be joining um, within a couple minutes. Okay, with that, um, uh, I'm assuming the. I do have the others as well. Um, Tasha Fuller, if you wanted to go ahead with her. Um, sure. Let's let's jump ahead and and we'll okay. go to the um, uh, little deer. Oh wait, actually, sorry, Melanie is should be joining. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on with her connection. Um, I'll give you a moment, Brooke, to okay. figure that out. And what I'll do is I'll move us into the adoption of the General Council minutes of February 14th. Give um, Council a second to, okay. Thank you, Michelle. Been moved by Michelle. Is there a seconder? Looking for a seconder for I, General I'm Council second. minutes. Uh, thank you, Gary. I've been, been properly moved and seconded. Um, is there any further questions, comments, corrections from the minutes? Seeing none, going to the vote. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, motions passed. Okay, Brooke. Um, she's still having some technical difficulties, so I will let Tasha in the room. Perfect. Okay, so while she's joining, this is um, a motion to provide permission for some filming to be done, specifically on some hiking trails, uh, the skate park, um, uh, as well as the Moccasin Trail cement pad uh, in and around March 7, 2029. So Tasha just gave council some context uh, and uh, you have the floor. Welcome. Hi there. Um, is Jesse in here? So, yep, I'm in here. Um, okay, so yes, we are. Um, am I able to share the screen? Absolutely. Can I do? Would you like okay. me to start up um, at first, Tasha? Sure. I I'll just give them. Um, if I could, if I could share, open. Sorry. Um, we have no, light. no, that's not going to work. <laughs> uh, um, I want to share the screen. How do you get? Okay. Uh, um, desktop. Opens. Sorry about this. So, okay. So, um, I really wish I could share the screen. Um, so the location schedule um, is, well, the tech survey um, is this Friday at, um, it would be uh, at five o'clock PM at the Moccasin Trail. Um, I spoke with Brooke and she had mentioned that, uh, Tech survey shouldn't shouldn't be a problem because it's just fifteen to twenty crew members coming in to take a look if everything's going to be okay. Um, they did want the filming to be um, March seventh would be the first day of filming at the hiking trails behind the um, the moccasin trail where the skits the cement pad is. Um, we we're hoping we could get. Uh, like the cement pad so we could set up tents and um for makeup and hair and put a porta potty there for the day so people could go to the bathroom and um there was 40 crew members um so i was hoping uh to get the uh, the parking lot at the gaylord palace arena because it's the closest to the moccasin trail and later on that day we're filming at 1300 cheesewood road at um rick rick brand's house and if if we could get parking still at the gaylor palace arena and just shuttle people to that to his house um that uh yeah can i you want me to jump in here for a second tasha 
Sure. Okay, so first of all, I just want to say thank you for um, considering us on your agenda tonight. Uh, I'm Jesse Anthony, Onondaga Nation Beaver Clan, and I have a production company called Pass Through Productions. And I've been asked by John Elliott, who's also a um, Six Nations uh, community member and filmmaker. Um, we're coming. I signed a, everything I've been signing on Facebook is a bunch of res kids trying to make a movie. Uh, so, <laughs> so we are filming a short film um, that is about... Uh, it's a story that John has worked very closely with some of the residential school survivors. Um, and it's about two young women who, two young girls who run away for Christmas. Um, and so it's just to show a little bit more of a hopeful, a hopeful uh, relationship between an older, uh, an older girl and a younger girl. Um, and so, yeah, one of the locations we wanted to film in, John had filmed there before for a um, tribe uh, called Red uh, music video. So we went back to this location, which is the skate pad and the bushes just behind there uh, on Moccasin Trail. So just for keeping people out of the way in terms of parking, we're just wondering if that we can put all of our crew parking um, at the arena for 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 the day. Um, usually our day is about 10 to, 10 to 12 hours. Um, we have three different locations we're filming at and then um, have our bigger equipment trucks on the side of the road there um, uh, so that we can bring all of our equipment and all of our uh, locations gear onto the skate pad where we'll use as more of a circus home base while we're filming in the bush. So that's kind of what we're doing um, and just wanted to know if we could get permission to do that. Thanks for um, that, Jesse. And I oh. also, uh, I, I had also um, wanted to mention that I'm, I didn't do an introduction either. <laughs> um, it's my first <laughs> time. Just nervous. So uh, my, name's Tasha, my name's Tasha Fuller. Um, I'm Standing Pine Productions in Oshwegan. Um, I talked with the, the previous chief about Standing Pine Productions as a location service for, um, for films to come. Uh, be filmed in Oshwegan. Um, and this is my first time actually going and trying to do this, my, you know, all myself and or organize all the locations. And I'm just learning everything. And uh, I'm learning that <laughs> the, the time schedule is crazy. And it's like changing all the time. And yeah, people mad at me now. And so no 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 nobody's mad Tasha <laughs> is doing an excellent job um I'm training her as best I can but she has definitely been on the ball and doing an amazing job and that's something that I really hope to do in the future is bring more opportunity to our community to our youth to anybody that wants to be in film and learn um we're also putting it out there to bring some trainees onto set I myself might be in front of you in April or May um about my own film that I'm bringing to shoot uh, around that time. So yeah, Tasha's doing a wonderful job. She's on the ball and she really has a great idea uh, in terms of being a hub for locations for productions that want to come in. So I'm showing her as much as I possibly know about the film industry in the locations part. Um, so yeah, she's she's doing a really excellent job. And um, I I wanted to, my goal, um, I, I I made this, I made my company, I think it was back in December of 2013. I had spoken about it and um, kind of made it my website and everything. I've been working since December 2013 with, I started out teaching acting, bringing acting coaches from Toronto, uh, acting actors from Toronto and movies, and then bringing them down to teach at my mom's Michelle Farmer Street against the modeling teach them I started out that way and then I slowly got my way into locations and um, I want to do production <laughs> as well and you know I have a lot of dreams um yeah and yeah so um, yeah we just would love permission to film <laughs> oh yeah and um there was one more thing is um I wanted to I was hoping that one day I could make a website and put this all together and like yeah make a website and I was thinking of all these ideas of yeah but yeah amazing presentation <laughs> thank you uh just for your um for your mentorship and and Tasha don't stop uh you're you're doing an amazing amazing job and and uh, we need uh inspiring uh people like you to keep this uh going so 
uh, thank you for both of your dedication and, and, and inspiring this film to get to this uh, particular point. Uh, I do see some questions, so I'm going to turn it over to Sherry Lynn. Mm -hmm. I just had to turn um, Melba's down. Um, it's good to see you guys. Um, Hi. Great job. Hi. Very, very proud of you. We're all proud of you. So your hard work and I'm coming here tonight and I'll move it that these guys have um, permission or whatever they need. I just ask for um, Edmund, I don't know if Darren's on, to give um, Parks and Rec a heads up that they'll be using the parking lot or whatever for, for the shuttle. Other than that, um, keep up the good work, ladies, and um, good job. Thanks. Thank you. Um, there was a there was a release form that we needed fill, uh, con <laughs> uh, locations release formed um, signed. Yeah, we for sake of um, also my production company, I do have uh, insurance with a five million dollar liability. So wherever that needs to go, I can um, address that to to the corporation. Um, but yeah, I mean, on another note, I'd love to get in front of council to just talk about uh, a little bit of the film industry in terms of getting funding from these organizations um, and putting it back into the community. Like we will be having some uh, non-Indigenous and Indigenous people staying at the cabins. Um, we got a, a good deal uh, there. Uh, and so, yeah, just utilizing our community. So it means a lot for you to, um, to help us out in that kind of way. Yeah, amazing, and amazing. I did want to mention now that I'm just here, I, I did want to mention my idea of having a website, kind of like a map, kind of like a Google map. And if you had a house or a, a place of business you wanted to put on as a location, you could upload it to the website. I wanted to make mm -hmm. something like that um, for my business. Amazing. Well, um, I'm just going to, before I go to Darren and Michelle, um, Sherry Lynn has moved the motion. I'm just going to read it for the benefit of the community. So mm -hmm. it reads that the Six Nations of the Grand River Electric Council provide permission to film Little Deer within the Six Nations of the Grand River, more specifically on the hiking trails behind the skate park and use of moccasin trail cement pad on or around March 7th, 2023. So that's yeah. been moved by Councillor uh, Sherry Lynn and seconded yeah. by Greg. Okay, I haven't been properly moved and seconded. I'm gonna move us into context and questions. So Darren and then Michelle. Uh, thanks, I just wanted to say hi to Jesse. I haven't seen Jesse in a very long time. Hi. Nice to see you. Um, nice, to see you. <laughs> nice to see you too. I know, I know you've done some amazing things and I'm also very proud of you. Um, Thank you. And and Tasha, thank and you you're, you guys are doing great work and we need more artists. You know, I come from the artist field and it's kind of like another chapter of my life, but it's it's good to see that there's there's young folks like yourselves keeping the, <laughs> the flame burning. Um so I just wanted to say that I'm here to support you like uh, in terms of obviously Sherilyn's point about uh, making sure we have the the space for you for parking and security, your insurance. Um so reach out to my office uh, anytime and I can help you with that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, it might be an idea to just notify the police as well if you're going to be parking on the road or yep. anything like that. So I, I'm, if if you need my guidance, just give me, give me a call, and we're here to help you. And awesome, good to hear. Okay, cool, awesome, thank you. Thanks for that, Darren, Michelle. Great job, ladies. It's so nice to see that you know we're out there, we're educating community, and we're using everything our human resources, our community. Um, and, and so we have a lot of actually aspiring um, young and older actresses and, and actors. So um, I was going to move it, but Sherry Lynn and Greg have. So all the best and we'll probably see you um, out in the village. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Audrey. Oh, she's muted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody muted me. I just <laughs> wanted to say congratulations, Tasha and Jesse. There you go. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> Good luck in everything, ladies. And welcome, welcome home and do a lot of a lot of work here. And Thank inspire, you. keep inspiring our youth. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, with everyone. I don't see any further questions. So with that, uh, I'm going to move us into the vote. All in favor? Are there any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion has passed. Motion to waive second reading. Moved by Sherry Lynn, second by Greg. All in favor? Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we should give a round of applause if we all could. Um, so congratulations, thank ladies, you. and we look forward to this amazing work going forward. Uh, thank you for your time today uh, and the great presentation. We're all proud. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Oh, no. Uh, I don't think I said it, but just for the record, the uh, waiving of second reading passed. Okay, Council, I do see Melanie is now in the room, so I'm going to move us back up to uh, delegation number two. And um, if you can provide just a quick context, uh, Tammy did provide us uh, with a quick context, but um, and then uh, the floor is yours, Melanie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Melanie Pilon, um, and um, I'm here to, uh, as a follow-up presentation, um, I understand that I had uh, my colleagues from Bell Canada were here a few weeks ago. Um, so just to, I'll provide a little bit of background on myself and then I can, uh, can jump into, I do have a short presentation. Uh, that I believe Shirley um, presented council with. Um, so again, my name is Melanie Pilon. I, um, I'm located, I'm, my official title for Bell is Senior Manager for Indigenous Relations. I'm based out of my home office in Wawa, Ontario, so a little bit uh, further north than uh, Six Nations. I'm originally from um, my family is from Wakwemkong, unceded territory on Manitoulin Island. My mother's family is from there. My father's family is from Mishpacotan First Nations. So that's what has brought uh, my family to Wawa, if anybody knows where Wawa is. Um, the Indigenous relations uh, position is very new to Bell Canada. I've only been with Bell for just over a year. And uh, they found me in Wawa, and in Wawa I will remain. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, as I'm very closely located into to most of the, the First Nation and communities in which we serve up in the 705-807 uh, region. However, I have had the chance to, uh, to meet with uh, Lonnie and, uh, and uh, the members of your, uh, your CAP team on a number of occasions uh, in your community. And so I do have a short presentation. Please feel free to stop me if you have any questions or comments and, um, and we can just go from there. Burke, I'm not sure if I'm able to share my screen. I'll just give it a try and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Can everybody see that? Yep, we can see it. Perfect. Oh, I think you can probably see my face on part of that screen. So as a follow-up, I understand that the business, uh, Bell Business Intelligence Unit was uh, made a presentation a couple of weeks ago requesting uh, approval for a door-to-door -door solicitation. And um, unfortunately, Bell's such a huge business that um, they did not know that there were a lot of other discussions that uh, I was having with the CAP team. And... Um, they kind of went in and requested this um, permission without kind of having a full understanding of, of all the things that were going on between Bell and Six Nations. Um, Shirley uh, Johnson reached out to me after the presentation and asked a few questions and provided a little bit more background. It was my understanding that after the presentation, the elected council wasn't particularly keen on a door-to-door -door, uh, solicitation program. Uh, on the territory, and they thought uh, that the, the the thinking behind that was, um, you know, there might be a, a few a better way of going about things. So um, I took that after having a, a conversation with Shirley. I took that um, that message back to our team, and we certainly agree with the elected council. Um, we're 
we want to you know make sure that anything that any program that we roll out uh, is in line with the uh, with the views of elected council. Um, so we you know we're we're scrapping the idea of a door to door solicitation program. You certainly know what's best for your community and what will be best received. But in lieu of of a door to door solicitation program, um, we wanted to uh, maybe place more attention on implementing a customized um, marketing program, perhaps um, a targeted mail out marketing campaign, uh, or perhaps um, maybe get a little bit more information on how we could best do um, uh, in-person kiosk style. So maybe if there's a large event, um, we could do kind of a booth and encourage people to sign up. Um, people are able to go to the website now and put in their address. Address and uh, very, um, you know, people don't know about that. So, um, oh, I, you can probably see that my internet cable connection is unstable because I live in Wawa and we don't have Bell Fiber here. I was going to ask, are you on Bell? <laughs> no, I'm on Starlink. <laughs> So um, one of the things that Shirley did ask me to come back to with is a map. So the wireless internet product that we have uh, that's available in Six Nations is uh, it's wireless. So it depends on on uh, sight line. So I did provide the map in the presentation and Shirley does have a copy. So we, you know, if you want to see it a little bit closer up, um, but it does cover really the entire the entire territory. So so that's pretty good news. Other considerations and options that I did want to take uh, take a few minutes to discuss. I'm going to just take myself out of this screen here. Um, other considerations that I did want to discuss is is the discussions that I'm having with the CAP team is around the uh, federal land permit, permitting, the 28-2 permits, and the 58-3 permits that we get, uh, that we must obtain with the CP landholders. Um, we, as I'm sure everybody knows here, um, the Bell permitting expired in 1999. So we do, um, that was when our last permitting expired, it was 24 years ago. Um, that particular permitting was granted for the specific purpose of providing telephone service to subscribers. Um, since then, any of the work that we have been doing in the territory, uh, a BCR was granted or we've obtained permission uh, directly be, by email through the Public Works Department. Unfortunately, that wasn't the right way about going, you know, that wasn't the proper process. Um, and as a consequence, in 2017, uh, the elected council of the day implemented a no dig order, uh, preventing Bell from installing any new facilities. So that has been problematic and has kind of stopped any uh, Bell from, you know, providing any new services to um, any customers, residential or commercial, and has stopped any uh, any new fiber for coming to the area. When I was brought on last year, one of my first things to, that I did was reach out to the CAP team, Lonnie and his team, and, and re re initiated discussion so we could kind of move that along because it that was you know one of the main reasons why I was brought on board is we do recognize that, uh, you know, that that was wrong and we wanted to write it as a corporation. So we are having those discussions. Um, unfortunately, the no dig order um, has prevented Bell Wholesale from providing quotations from other um, vendors and wholesalers um, from, providing services to to other organizations and other ISPs, internet service providers, 
in the area um, for other big projects. And I know um, I have read in the press that Six Nations is part of the SWIFT project. And these carriers are looking at bringing um, fiber services to the territory. Um, unfortunately, because Bell is so large, they come to Bell provides the backhaul through wholesalers. Um, so we've kind of found ourselves between a rock and a hard place here. I'm not sure um, if everybody's following me because it is quite technical, um, but Bell really provides the backhaul services that other ISPs use to provide a, a retail service. So one of the things that I'm asking for, um, for the elected council to, to, uh, to consider is to, to lift the no dig order that's currently in place. And that will allow uh, the Bell wholesale side to start to generate quotes for anyone else looking for, looking to provide services. To date, we've had uh, many creative permission requests from third parties. Uh, such as uh, Indigenous Services Canada and others saying, you know, we have spoken with um, the chief and or the elected council. We really want to get um, kind of break this bottleneck that's preventing um, connectivity on in Six Nations. But what really is the stranglehold is the no dig order. So we really need to get that lifted so our wholesale side can, can do that. Um, hopefully that this is something that, uh, that the elected council will consider um, knowing that, that I'm now sitting at the table uh, with the CAP team. Is there any questions on that? Um, I imagine there's tons. And mm -hmm. and I and I really thank you for illuminating some of these issues that uh, we have uh, probably not had context, proper context, or information on in the past. Um, I, and and you know this presentation probably would have been helpful to the um, the the Internet Broadband Task Force uh, a few years ago that we started. Um, so what I'm going to ask Melanie is is that. Uh, I'm going to open the floor for questions, uh, keep them brief, because uh, I think there's a lot more digging we have to do and due diligence on our end. Um, and I'm also going to ask that uh, we get a presentation from the CAP team um, and, and then invite uh, invite you back um, okay. at, at a future date once we do some of that kind of due diligence. Um, one of the first questions that's kind of permeating around uh, my end of the council table, and I'll start off some of the questions, is um, can we use our own companies to do the dig? Absolutely. I so, Certainly something that Bell is interested in is um, right now, we Bell has no plans to do a dig of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, but for the wholesale orders, we don't want to provide a quote for another company to, to have to come in and dig. And we're going to provide a bell service through uh, because then we would be in direct contravention Correct. of uh, Six Nations order. So even though Bell wouldn't necessarily be the one digging, it's going to be our Bell services. And I believe that that's the spirit and intention of the no dig order. Mm -hmm. And the other kind of question too around the, the table is um, just on the customer service side, there's been many um, you know concerns. Uh, we fielded complaints. Uh, I've faced it myself in terms of uh, uh, trying to get the Bell service within the community. Um, is there a possibility where uh, we could have uh, some supports in terms of um, customer service representatives actually coming into the community and, and fielding questions of community members as well, um, and, or, or some sort of a process? And again, we're not looking for an answer today, but that's just a, a consideration we'll throw back 
uh, while we do our due diligence, because I think it's going to be important for us to to hear from the CAP team before uh, we make any commitments or move on any of these items. Absolutely. So, and I think it's one thing that I'm striving to do with, with my position, because um, currently the Indigenous Relations team is me, you're looking at her, mm -hmm. um, is to make sure that I can can build the relationships and build the supports that the community needs. So in terms of the sales effort in the community, you know, I'm not a salesperson, but if I could bring the salespeople into the community in the most appropriate way to field questions that any community members have, then I will certainly do what I can to make that happen. What I can say, Melanie, is your position in, um, in the past was sorely, sorely needed. So I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Uh, and uh, just want to remark on your approach of being respectful and, and coming to us with honesty and, and uh, open mind and open heart is very much appreciated. Um, not necessarily the experience we've had in the past. So um, definitely appreciate that. I do see one question. I'll go to Audrey. Thank you. Um, Melanie, do you uh, anticipate uh, Bell putting fiber on Six Nations? And also, what does wholesale owns mean? Is that going to the kiosk and everybody buying, or please explain? So at this time, Audrey, Bell has no plans on um, installing fiber in the community. At this point, our, our key objective is to permit the Bell facilities or the infrastructure that we already have on reserve. That's our primary objective. We certainly would love to, to service um, the community. And the best way that we can do that is through a wireless service right now. So we're able to do that. Um, we're able to offer right now, today, actually yesterday, a wireless option. So um, any of your community members can go online, type in their address to see if their if their residence is served, which is basically the whole community. And we don't need to add any equipment. We don't have to add any wire. So we're not in contravention of the dig order. And a modem will come. They can order a modem. It'll be mailed to their house. Um, so that's one way that we can improve service for your community today. Once we do have our permitting um, process all, you know, tied up and figured out, but as you know, the, the federal land permitting, it does take quite a long time. Then we would love to start to have those discussions around installing a, and improving the fiber optic network. Presently, um, we are improving the fiber network in many indigenous communities across Ontario. Um, so we would certainly be willing to sit down and have that conversation if it makes sense to do it. Um, and you would be willing to have us, we would. Um, I do know that uh, other carriers are interested in that as well. So it would be a business decision at that time. The Bell wholesale piece is that we have had other carriers, uh, Rogers tell us, approach us um, to sell them backhaul, we call it, or bat. So we would sell them the connectivity that they would, again, that they would use um, because Bell's kind of the biggest ISP. We, we have a whole department that does that. Uh, unfortunately, because they would have to dig and we would have to put Bell equipment into the ground, we're not able to do that at this time. So we don't even quote on it. We don't quote on the work at all. Thanks for that. I'm gonna move us uh, into our next question, Hazel. Yes, I would just like to ask you, um, <clears throat> approximately a couple of weeks ago, I had a, a telephone call from a Bell representative offering me this, um, wireless internet package. And um, as it turned out, um, she wanted me to switch our, like the television, the internet, 
we already have a Bell landline and I have a cell phone. And she wanted to offer me that pack, a full package from Bell Canada. Is this one and the same that you're offering? Will there so, be will there be adjusted rates? Say for instance, like the Bell landline. Um, I know most people are starting to take those out, but in some cases you need it for various reasons. So I guess what I want to know is having to having to have a landline and a cell phone together, like it adds up quite a bit per month. Mm -hmm. Is there a better package if you do go to that package offered where you'd connect your TV, your internet, your landline and your cell phone all together? So I have to admit, Hazel, I'm not part of the sales team, so I'm a little bit rusty oh, okay. on uh, what the packages are. But uh, the wireless internet package that I was asked to speak on by the business intelligence unit, um, uh -huh. just on my own experience, because I am a Bell customer myself, uh -huh. um, you, can, you can package everything. Um, what I will also mention is that our Bell internet wireless internet product uh, is eligible to be subsidized or you can get a special rate through uh, the federal program connecting families mm -hmm. so um, if you're eligible it's a program that the federal government offers uh, you apply and you can get a special discounted rate for twenty dollars a month oh yeah um, for eligible families and it's to to um and to ensure that you know those who might be living on a lower income um have access to to internet um they have to be participating um internet um service providers so participating isps um bell is one of them so mm -hmm. we are very proud to be part of that program I guess uh, when I say like it's necessary to have a landline is due to the fact like if you have a person with hearing problems and you can get those phones that have the um, ability to have a higher tone and volume. Uh, um, that's basically why we keep our landline in. So I don't know. I was just thinking that if there was a package deal for all of those combined it would uh, hopefully save some money per month. Thanks for that. And I think that's the information that we're hoping um, Melanie can work with her team and come back with uh, yeah. while we do our due diligence on our side as well with the CAP team. Mm -hmm. Thank Absolutely. you. Perfect. Thank you for the question. Okay, so with that, I don't see any more questions, Melanie. I'm going to hold the two most or the motion uh, that's being recommended today until we invite you back and, and do a little due diligence, as I said, and, and work with the CAP team. Um, because I think out of respect, we should uh, hear from them as well. And um, yeah, if there's no further questions, just want to thank you for your time. And uh, we look forward to continuing our working relationship uh, into the future. So uh, we'll be in touch in a few weeks. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And McGwitch, uh, have a great day. And thanks again for having me. Mm -hmm. Thanks. OK, uh, good discussion, Council. Um, going to move us into scheduling. Um, Oh, sorry. No, council reports. Any council reports? I had one, Nathan, but I didn't get it completed, so I'll wait till next time. Okay, thanks for that, Hazel. Okay, seeing no additional uh, council reports, I'll move us into scheduling. Uh, we do have two items under scheduling. Uh, the first is the Six Nations Agricultural Society meeting. The Agricultural Society is inviting Six Nations elected council to attend a meeting on Thursday, March 9th at six o'clock to discuss ways to collaborate on the 2023 Six Nations Fall Fair. Uh, Michelle. 
Tammy, is that the same night as the transportation study being um, given to community? I will confirm. I kind of think it is. I do too. Thank you. I, I have a feeling I have that for the ninth as well. Yep. Caitlin? Uh, March 9th is the transportation study. Three to five is the first session. And then uh, six to seven, I believe, is the second session. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks for that information. So uh, is council accepting uh, the invitation from the Ag Society? Given we could all attend the first session, I guess, for the transportation. House Council schedules. I'll be at the Ake Society meeting. And I'll do transportation in the afternoon. Okay. I can uh, schedule that way as well. Go ahead, Sherilyn. I'm good for the night. The night, the night, the night. For the fair. Okay. How's everybody else's schedules? Greg's good. Melba's good. Okay, I think we have good representation. Audrey, I see your hand. You're good. I think we have good representation. So we'll respond in, in the affirmative that we will accept the meeting. Uh, Tammy, just note that for the chief as well. Uh, sorry. Darren. Oh, sorry, Audrey. I had my hand up for going to the transportation. You're going to go to the six o'clock session though, not the three? I think, I don't know. So. I have to see so what the, other meetings I have that day. Okay. Uh, but I think we have good representation from council to accept the meeting. Um, Darren. Uh, just just quickly, um, I just wanted to suggest that um, with, with tourism, uh, we should have uh, a staff as well attend uh, to accompany councillor on that because there's obviously a lot of opportunity to collaborate on tourism opportunities around the fair. So I'll undertake to make sure that there's a resource available for that as well. Amazing, Darren. Thanks for that. Okay. Tammy, I think we're good to respond in the affirmative, uh, just making sure the chief and, and hoping the chief will be available as well. Um, and we are now uh, health planning meeting to be rescheduled, suggested new date of March 30th, 30 and 31, as the 21, 22 are no longer feasible. So how are folks schedules for March 30, 31? Good. Hazel's good. Sherry Lynn's okay. good. Michelle's good. Greg's good. Melba, you good? Audrey, Carrie. Time is at eight. The meeting is. Uh, I'm assuming we're doing all days for both of those times. So that's uh, what, nine to four? Meeting. I've got a meeting from one to two. On which day? 31st, Friday. Okay. March. I'm assuming you'd be okay with us proceeding? I am. Okay, I think we're good to go, Tammy. Those dates are good. March 30, 31 for the health planning meeting for that reschedule. Okay, thank you. I'll confirm that with health. Okay, thanks, Council. Uh, any updates on community safety? That's a standing item. I know we've been having uh, a number of uh, discussions on anti-bullying. Meetings are coming up. And we'll have more to report at that time. Okay. That brings us to item number nine, motion to adjourn. Moved by Sherry Lynn. I can second. Uh, seconded by Michelle. All in favor? Any opposed? 
Seeing none, motions carried. Would like to thank the community for their participation today. Um, good discussions uh, with our delegates and uh, wish everybody a safe and, and healthy uh, rest of your Tuesday night. Yeah.